Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. This video is part of the Biology Topics Revision series. Today we'll be looking at blood in circulation. And please do not forget to subscribe to our channel because I'll be bringing you many interesting topics that can help you in your revision and preparation for your exams. So let's begin. So here we're going to begin by looking at the need for a circulatory system. Of course, everybody knows blood is pumped around the body through blood vessels. And as it's pumped, it carries nutrients as well as oxygen from the lungs to the rest of the body. It carries carbon dioxide from all parts of the body towards the lungs to be removed from the body. It carries nutrients from the gut to, of course, to the liver or to other parts of the body where those nutrients should go. Blood carries urea from the liver to the kidneys to be excreted. It carries hormones, antibodies, and other substances. Blood also carries heat around the body. So blood plays very many functions that are necessary for organisms to survive. Now, when we look at organisms, we have two kinds. We have single-celled organisms as well as multicellular organisms. So for single-celled organisms like the amoeba, paramecium, or the others, they have no circulatory system because, of course, it's just a single cell. There is no need since single-celled organisms have a large surface area to volume ratio. It's easier for substances to diffuse into those organisms. Yeah, but if you compare them to multicellular organisms that are really huge, they have a very low surface area to volume ratio. So they need a system that can carry these substances like oxygen as well as nutrients in order for them to be delivered to all cells in their, in their body, basically. So the surface area determines how much oxygen goes into, an, uh, into the specific volume. The volume also is also going to determine how much oxygen is going to be used there because the volume within the organism tells you how many cells are in there. And there will be, it means if an organism has a lot of volume, it means there are so many cells and there is a lot of uh, respiration that should be carried out. So a lot of energy is required. And so, so many nutrients as well as a lot of oxygen will be required for those processes. Circulatory systems. They contain the single circulatory system as well as the double circulatory system. A single circulatory system using an example of a fish. So here blood is pumped from the heart to the gills. This is the oxygenated blood pumped from the heart to the gills where it's going to be oxygenated. And then from there, it leaves to the rest of the body where it offloads oxygen and then returns in one full cycle. So we call this single circulatory system because blood comes through the heart only once in a complete cycle. On the other hand, we have double circulatory system. And in this case, blood from the rest of the body, the oxygenated blood comes to the heart. And then from here, it's pumped to the lungs where it gets oxygenated. And then the oxygenated blood returns to the heart from which it's pumped to go to the rest of the body. Now, Double circulatory system has more advantages over single circulatory system because since blood comes to the heart two times, as it leaves, as oxygenated blood leaves the heart to go to the rest of the body, it goes at a higher pressure, meaning the parts of the body or the organs will receive oxygen as well as nutrients more efficiently in comparison to single circulatory system. For single circulatory system, we can see the heart pumps and uh, as blood goes to the gills, it's going to lose some pressure. So by the time the blood or the oxygenated blood leaves the gills to go to the rest of the body, it's at a little bit lower pressure. The thing about this is that this is, of course, organisms that use these two different kinds of circulatory systems have attained them through adaptation. And we can see with fish, single circulatory system is okay for them because they do not need to move. Uh, that they have less activity, so they require less oxygen in comparison to an animal of the same mass. So because most of the, the water does some movement for them or it helps them to move more efficiently. So energy requirements due to movement are a little bit reduced in comparison to animals of the same size that are on land. So that we can see here, I say the uh, we see double circulatory system is more efficient than single since blood can reach the organs at a higher pressure and it travels more quickly and organs receive oxygen as well as nutrients efficiently. And here we can see in single circulation, pressure is lost as blood goes through the gills. So it reaches their organs at a lower pressure. So we can continue to the next part. Here we're going to efficiently look at double circulatory system, but I've already explained a bit of it. 
in double circulatory system, we have two kinds. We have the pulmonary circulation as well as the systemic circulation. In the pulmonary circulation, we can see blood will leave. Uh, blood is going to leave the heart. Okay, let me make this one smaller. In here, blood is going to leave the heart and then go to the lungs where it's going to be oxygenated. And from the lungs, it returns back to the heart. In that half a cycle, that is what we call pulmonary circulation because it involves the lungs. Pulmonary has to do with lungs. And in systemic circulation, blood, which is oxygenated, will leave the heart to go to the rest of the body where it offloads oxygen to the tissues. And then the deoxygenated blood will return to the heart in that other part of a cycle. So we call that the systemic circulatory cycle or systemic circulatory system. So both the pulmonary as well as the systemic make up what we call double circulatory system. So let's move on to the next page. Here we're going to look at the structure of the heart more efficiently or more intricately. So here we can see the heart is made up of uh, four chambers. We have the right atrium, the left vent right ventricle, and we have the left atrium as well as the left ventricle. So those are the four chambers. And within the heart, leading to some sections of the heart, we have what we call valves. Example, we have this one, which is the tricuspid valve. We have this one here, which is the bicuspid valve. And we have that as well as that, we call those the semilunar valves. Or you can say, since this one is leading into uh, the pulmonary artery, we can call it the pulmonary valve. And this one leading into the iota, you can also call it the aortic valve. So the semilunar valves also have their own names. You can say pulmonary valve or aortic valve based on the blood vessel it's leading into. Now we have the superior vena cava here, which is, uh, of course, coming from the upper part of the body. And we have the inferior vena cava coming from the lower part of the body. Both of them deliver their blood into the right atrium because they carry the oxygenated blood. We have the pericardium. Of course, this is um, some, maybe advanced levels. That's when they require to label this. But uh, the, whatever level, those are the major parts. Of course, we also have the septum, which separates the, two, the two, two sections of the heart, the left as well as the right. So lastly, let's look at that describing or what occurs during double circulation. In double circulation, blood is going to come to the heart. As it comes to the heart, it has to go through to atria first, whether it's left or right. So the oxygenated blood will go to the left atrium while the deoxygenated blood will go to the right atrium. And then they will go through the valve. So of course, as the atria receive the blood, they are going to contract. Contraction creates pressure that pushes the blood to go to the ventricles. And then as blood flows through the ventricles, the valves through which that blood passed have to close and then the ventricles will contract, creating pressure and pushing blood through either the iota or the pulmonary artery so that they can be distributed to the parts of the body that they have to go to. So here I say the oxygenated blood from the rest of the body enters the right atrium through the vena cava, oxygenated blood from the lungs enters the left atrium through the pulmonary vein. This is the artery. So in this case, the atria cannot flow to the ventricle because the bicuspid valve and the tricuspid valves prevent this. So basically that blood is prevented from flowing down to the ventricles until when the atria contract high enough to cause the opening of the valves. So the atria contract and the valves open, then the blood flows into the ventricles and the valves of the atria cannot allow backflow of blood. Of course, they will close. The ventricles then contract creating pressure forcing the semilunar valves to open. Again, I say the semilunar valves are the aortic valve as well as the pulmonary valve. They will open, causing the blood to go through and the blood will be pumped to the rest of the body or into the lungs, depending on where, which part of the ventricles or which, whether it was coming from the left ventricle or from the right ventricle. So this brings us to the end of blood and circulation. I'll see you in the next video. Please do not forget to subscribe. Bye-bye. Uh,